I'm George Curtis. Welcome to It's Your Environment. This week I have a real treat for all of us. One of my favorite people, Susan Campbell, is here. She's probably here helping her dad at EAA. You know, he's well-known local historian and he gives presentations all over the area about historical things. We've had Susan on the show before. She's an adventurous young lady. Went to Alaska 20-some years ago as a teacher in Fairbanks. She and her husband went places that I wish I could go, and you're going to wish you can go. She has made another real interesting, challenging trip this summer, and she's going to tell you about it. Susan, welcome to the show. Hello, George. Nice to be here. Tell us a little bit about the overview of the trip and how the planning got started. Mm -hmm. Well, six friends of mine and I went for 31 days through the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which is in northeast Alaska, and it's a... Um, a a uh, 19.6 acre, million acre um, wildlife refuge that Congress um, designated in 1980. And um, so it's huge, no trails, and the only access is either um, on the edges by um, a road, the Hall Road, that you can drive north to Prudhoe Bay and you could access the refuge from that road or get flown in by a bush plane. And so we planned a trip that would take a month and we flew in with a bush plane and um, backpacked, pack rafted and kayaked for about 200, 225 miles across the refuge from the southern border to the Arctic Ocean and um, to a village out on the coast and then flew back to Fairbanks. So it took us um, a lot of planning all winter to get ready for this trip, planning food and equipment and routes and maps and everything. and. Um, we got it all organized the day before we left, and we took off on June 15th and returned on July 15th. Well, one of the keys, of course, is the people. I don't think you could go to the bar at the pump house <laughs> in Fairbanks and pick six Alaskans and make this work. No. So these people obviously were selected because they were friends, mm -hmm. because they were intelligent, they were knowledgeable, mm -hmm. and you knew them. Tell yes. us a little bit about that. I went with five friends, and um, four of them are people I've known for about 20 years, um, two married couples. Um, John Miller and Lou Brown, they've been in Alaska 20-some years, and they're um, amazing, adventurous people and have done a lot of trips th themselves. And then another couple, Susan Noctical and Franz Muter, and they've done um, a lot of trips in the Arctic and other places together, and I have traveled with them some, and but none of us had traveled together um, like this on a long trip. And then another friend that I didn't know well, but um, uh, Sven Groggy, who was a friend of um, John Miller's, and we all got together. And the idea last fall was, let's you know, go on a trip, and okay, and we can make this work. And and we did. And in 31 days, we never had a disagreement or any um, argument. We worked together. Um, it's not that we had one person leading and everyone following. We all just we, we were a team, and um, it was awesome. Well, I've been on good trips and I've been on bad trips, uh -huh. uh, and probably more bad trips than good trips. Mm -hmm. uh, the combination of people are important. Mm -hmm. Preparation is important. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is important. Mm -hmm. Conditioning mm -hmm. necessary for the challenge. Mm -hmm. And believe me, I've never been on a trip that's 1% as challenging as this mm -hmm. one. So these folks, including you, mm -hmm. really had to be ready physically, mentally, in terms of knowledge mm -hmm. and with a plan in case something went wrong. How did you do that? Okay, so we had um, a route picked out. So we knew our starting point where we would be flown to, and then we knew our ending point, and we looked at a lot of maps and um, picked a route, a general route where we wanted to be, country that we wanted to go through. Part of this route I had been on 12 years ago, backpacking, so I was familiar with a little bit of the country. But it's true, it's exciting to go to a new place, and when we, we picked this, um, the route that we chose, it's, we wanted to see this part of the refuge. It's really beautiful to cross the Brooks Range from the southern side to the northern side. But it took a lot of planning, um, looking at maps and then deciding how far we could go. We carried about um, 11 days of food, so then we knew we had to get resupplied and 
because we were going to pack raft, we knew those had the pack rafts had to come in with that food. So we had to put together what are called caches. So we had big steel drums that we would put um, food and our gear and everything in so that it could be flown in with the bush plane so that <clears throat> it would be safe and bears couldn't get into it. So all, and then um, we did another cache of kayaks and kayak gear and food. So those two caches had to be all planned and put together before we even left. So the amount of time and lists, pages and pages of lists of gear and food and everything. And like you said, you have to have all your first aid material and everything for every kind of weather to be ready. But of course, you don't want to take too much because you have to carry everything. So um, lots of checking and rechecking and meeting. And we, um, we dried a lot of our own food. So that took a lot of time during the winter to make food and dry it in food dehydrators and get it packaged and labeled and put in different um, piles to go in these caches. So lots of lists and, and, um, and always changing. And, um, and that, actually, that's fun, I think, to make those plans and get together and eat dinner together and go through lists and go through all the equipment and stuff. But um, toward the end, it's like the last two weeks was constant getting ready, packing. And my house was just filled with piles of gear and food and first aid things and it we had to go from temperatures from it could have snowed to rain to sun so you have to be ready for all those things so well i'm thinking of the conditioning <clears throat> you certainly couldn't afford to have somebody with a broken leg that you had to drag mm, uh, you yeah. couldn't afford to get sick mm -hmm. and there's some stress involved in mm -hmm. the constant physical pressures of carrying a load mm -hmm. and a lot I, I haven't found any flat land in Alaska certainly that part of Alaska doesn't have any and so somebody could have gone crazy uh, and <laughs> that could be a challenge so there are lots of things that you had to think about mm -hmm. first of all you you were in shape I'll bet yep we all we do a lot of things during the winter we ski and um, and then you know in the spring ride bikes hike walk um, so everybody is just generally in good shape because you couldn't do a trip like this without um, being in good shape. But it's always interesting at the beginning of a trip, you start with really heavy packs. Our packs weighed, I think my pack weighed 57 pounds at the start. And, um, you, you know, so here you are at the beginning with the heaviest pack. And of course, as you go, you, you get stronger and stronger hiking every day with a heavy pack. Um, and that feels really good. And you, but to be aware of that, you couldn't go into a trip like that without being in shape, or you could get hurt. Let's yeah. take our first break. We've okay. uh, covered a lot of ground. <laughs> mm -hmm. You had the plan. You picked the people. Mm -hmm. uh, you you worked on all of the organization. Mm -hmm. You got in shape, mm -hmm. and uh, you were ready for step two. Two. We'll be yeah. right back. Thank you. Welcome back to It's Your Environment. I'm George Curtis. My guest is Susan Campbell, who just told me that she graduated from Oshkosh West. But uh, after yeah. that, uh, she, she kind of uh, went north, <laughs> and uh, you've been teaching school in Fairbanks how long? Uh, 20, this will be my 24th year. So I graduated from West in 1974, and I did some traveling and went to college, and, but I went to Alaska in 1989, and I've been there ever since. Well, we're talking about a great trip, and mm -hmm. personally, I can't wait. Mm -hmm. uh, we discussed in the first segment the preparation, and mm -hmm. it was almost <clears throat> a lifetime preparation in many of these cases. <laughs> but now take us, you're leaving Fairbanks on the mm -hmm. trip. It's finally beginning. Mm -hmm. You start us out. Okay, we, um, we flew in a small commercial plane to a village called Arctic Village, which is right at the southern edge of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It's a Gwich'in Athabascan village. Um, has a long gravel runway. We landed there. We got out of the plane. There is not a terminal or anything, so we're on the side of the runway. And a bush pilot, um, there's actually an air service, Yukon Air. Um, he flew in in a 185, and he could take three people at a time. So three of us got in the plane, and he flew us up to our, our beginning point, which is, was on the Shinjik River took about an hour and a half for him to fly three people in and come back and get the other three and flew in and then we were there. So we were in the um, 
on the southern side of the Brooks Range out in huge mountains and he landed on uh, a, a dry, it's called a driest bench, driest are flowers that grow and they usually um, very flat tundra that he could land with big tires. Um, and we unloaded all our gear and said goodbye to him and he flew off and we started walking. And so we, from that point, we had picked a route. We followed um, the Shinjik to closer to its headwaters and then went over some mountain passes to another river called, it's a big river in the refuge called the Congacut River. We followed parts of that and you'll see we crossed high mountain passes. We saw many, many doll sheep, like a group of nine rams all silhouetted on the skyline was a highlight one morning. And um, so we would just follow the passes, go over the passes, follow, go down, follow the river, um, crossing the river back and forth and back and forth because um, the rivers are very braided. We had really good weather in the beginning. It was actually hot, um, walking in short sleeves and um, you'll see we would just stop in the sun and wildflowers everywhere and um, a couple times we saw grizzly bears like across the river and as soon as they hear us they perk up and just run away but it's always great to see them and we um, one time we're walking high, kind of on a cut bank above the river, and we see something on the gravel bar down below the river, and it's running towards us. And we first thought, is it a caribou? No, it's getting closer. It was a wolf. We all stop and just stand there, and we were up wind of it, so it didn't smell us. And it gets within in maybe, oh, 50 yards, and it sees us and stops and just, we just all of us, six people and one wolf. We're just looking and it walks closer and it's just looking at us and sits down and we're all just frozen. It's just an, it's an awe-inspiring experience to see such a wild animal. And it's not afraid and we're not afraid, but it's just this moment, minutes, where you just feel like you've been given a gift. And it watched us for quite a while and, and actually moved a little closer and then walked away and, and just kept sitting down and looking and we all, we just stand frozen watching. And then it, it just gets up and, and, you know, lopes away and till then you can't see it. And it's just, those kind of encounters are wonderful. So we backpacked for 10 days through the mountains like that, encountering um, bears a couple times, not close, we never had any problems, um, that wolf, lots of birds and it's nesting season so because there are no trees we would be walking and you'd find a nest right on the ground filled with eggs, ptarmigan, um, red poles, uh, um, says phoebes, uh, lapland longspurs and, and beautiful birds and the wildflowers were blooming and so that you just feel every day is a gift and because it's summer in the high Arctic, it's 24 hours of daylight, so the sun never goes down. So you go, go to bed at midnight and the sun is blasting into your tent. So, but you're so tired, you know, it doesn't matter. So it doesn't, if you didn't have a watch, it really wouldn't matter if you just travel on your own time frame. So um, that was wonderful. And um, we had some bad weather then. It Rain came, fog came in. Uh, we have to... Uh, you know, we're cooking on small fires or a little contraption called a Kelly kettle, which you make us fire in to boil water. We also had some um, stoves, MSR camp stoves. and But, you know, when it rains, things get cold. So we had gear for cold weather, snowed up high, and then you get wet and then you dry out and you keep going. So. I have never been on a stream in Alaska that wasn't ice cold. It's very cold. Just yeah. uh, you. you fall in or you <clears throat> put your leg in intentionally or accidentally and you're frozen. Mm. Uh, and that, so how, do, how did you stay clean on that cold water? Well, it is um, it is really cold water and you'll see we crossed a lot of streams, you know, some or part of the river that's really braided so it looks like we're crossing multiple streams. But um, when it was deeper and faster, you'll see we would, you know, hook arms, two or three people together to cross. One time we actually set up a rope, a safety rope to cross a um, part of the river that was pretty deep. And you get wet and you get cold. Um, we tr 
we did wear in the beginning we you have hiking boots but we had tennis shoes also that we would wear for our pack rafting which I'll tell you about but um, it, early on I would change my shoes put on my tennis shoes to cross the river but it was just I found that too cumbersome to do so your boots get wet and they just stay wet and and you are cold but you're wearing you know long underwear and and once you start walking with a big pack you warm up but yeah. This is going so fast, and I, I want know. to hear the rest of the trip. Okay. We're going to take our second break, oh. and we're going to come back, and you've got one more segment to finish okay. this trip. Okay. <laughs> we'll be right back. Welcome back to It's Your Environment. I'm George Curtis. Don't tell my wife, but I'm going on a month-long adventure <laughs> with, with Susan Campbell, and I'm enjoying every minute of it. <laughs> Let's take us on the rest of the trip, Susan. Well, after... 11 days of backpacking, we came to a cache. I told you we had put together a cache in big steel drums. And we unpacked 10 more days of food and our pack rafts, loaded all that into our backpacks and kept going. Um, a couple more days of backpacking through some beautiful wilderness. And we came to the Achillic River, which is a May, a big river in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge that runs out to the Arctic coast. And at that point, we put our, blew up our pack rafts. We had dry suits, life jackets, um, tied our packs to the rafts. And then for about eight days, we pack rafted down the Achillic River. So every day we were paddling and camping alongside the river. And that was fun. The pack rafts are a great way to travel in the wilderness. As you can see, you can carry your pack raft on your back. Um, they weigh about five pounds deflated, and um, you can go through some fast, heavy water in them, and they're very forgiving, and you can carry your big pack. So that was great, to be on the river paddling and moving and camping. And then in the evenings, we would go hike up to high points and look out and got some great vistas of where we'd been. And... Um, and after, you know, 20 days in the wilderness, you really get in a rhythm of being there and you're working together with um, the people you're with. And it's just, it's, it's hard to describe how wonderful it feels to be out like that. Everything is simplified. You have everything you need right there. One bowl, one spoon, one pot to cook in for everybody. And and you have great conversations in the evening and you laugh and tell stories and have philosophical conversations and you sleep really well at night because it's so peaceful and every day brings new adventures. So we did the pack rafting trip and um, you have to really be watching out because it's white water and and you just have to be paying attention so there's a little higher level of stress there but we had, everything went fine and um, we had no mishaps. And after 20 days, at that point, that same bush plane, the 185, came in and picked up three friends who had planned to leave after 20 days. And he took out some of our gear and brought in kayaks that we, another cache of gear. And so my friends John and Lou and I were left with the plane flew away with our friends, which is very strange. You're sitting there drinking tea, and this plane comes in, and half an hour later, your friends are gone, and it's very quiet. And we spent a day putting these kayaks together. They're kleppers, German-made kleppers, three of them. So they're solo kayaks, wood frame, and you'll see all the pieces go together. We packed them up. Now, at that point, that was a little more stressful. Kayaks are not as forgiving as pack rafts. The water was really um, fast. We'd had a lot of rain. All these tributaries pour into the Achillic. The water is high. Lots of rapids, lots of rocks. And kayaks, you have to really um, be precise about where you're paddling them. They're not going to spin around like the pack rafts. So there was some stress at the beginning of that. John and Lou and I really worked together and were very supportive of each other. But we looked back, we took no pictures for two days. It was pouring rain in very difficult water and we didn't have a camera out. But we made it through all of that and you feel like you've really accomplished something and that you think, I don't know if I can do this, and then you do it. And you feel that, um, you know, philosophically in your life, you can do things that you think you can't do. So we paddled um, out to the Arctic Ocean 
and when we got out there the water really leveled out and there you are in um, it's an amazing place the Arctic Sea and um, we paddled for about 45 miles from the delta of the Chilik to a village called Kaktovik and that was amazing there are barrier islands where all the sea ice piles up against it we could paddle across from the mainland oh, a few miles out to the barrier islands and polar bear tracks were down the barrier islands we knew we might see one but we didn't but we saw their tracks arctic fox tracks and um, sea ice and so we paddled along the coast in these um, lagoons protected by the barrier islands every day you know unloading the kayak setting up camp right on the edge of the uh, mainland and then we came to a place with no barrier islands and the sea ice is piled up against the shore so you'll see in the pictures we had to drag our, our kayaks across sea ice get in little leads paddle drag paddle carry our gear across land it took us about three days to go six miles once because of the sea ice portaging gear hauling boats and at the beginning we had many strategies of how to get through that sea ice and we tried various things hauling the boats across the tundra didn't work taking them apart we thought that would be really um, a pain and so but what we ended up doing worked and at the beginning we thought we might not be able to get through but we did and it, we paddled the last miles to across the um, open water to a village called Kaktovik, which is a, uh, a Nupiat village on the right out on the very far north coast of Alaska. And commercial planes come in there. So we paddled our kayaks right up to the um, gravel strip where the plane lands. We got out, took our boats apart, put it all back in our packs. The, plane come, the commercial plane comes in. We get on it, and three hours later, we're back in Fairbanks. So, In that whole period of time, except <clears throat> for your pilot, you didn't see any other people, did you? Um, the second day out, yeah. that we saw three men that flew into that same tundra strip that were going a different direction. So the second way back at the beginning, but otherwise we saw no people. Um, on the coast, we saw remnants of old, old sod and driftwood huts that had fallen in, probably back from the 1800s or before and during the whaling time when people lived on the coast and the Nupiat people lived out um, there. You are some of the very, very few people mm -hmm. to ever make that trip. Mm -hmm. And uh, you saw Alaska like Robert Service saw mm, it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that land the is unchanged since his time, and yes. <laughs> That's yes. right. I looked for my Robert Service book this morning oh. so I could come up with some poetry, but oh. like everything else in my life, it's misplaced. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but this is just a wonderful experience, mm -hmm. and uh, I thank you for sharing it with our viewers, and mm -hmm. we're going to make sure you've got a couple of discs to share with your friends. Thank you. Always thank wonderful you. to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank, thank you, George. No. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know who owns that precious piece of real estate that Susan Campbell and her friends just spent a month traveling? You do. And do you know that it hasn't changed any in the last 200 years? But do you know that there are many business commercial interests that want to take it from you piece by piece, slice by slice? Don't let them do it. Visit it yourself to the extent that your physical abilities allow you to do that and preserve it for future generations. It's yours, it's ours, it's theirs. Let's keep it the way it is. I'm George Curtis.